what else? What else can I talk about? This is I'm excited because I'm wrapping this up, but I'm excited because I'm giving you guys everything I know. Um, I'm hoping not to leave anything out. You know, it's a lot that I'm putting into this video. The rumors. I should talk about rumors now. The Ermac rumor started in MK1. I believe this is this is the story. I've had different stories from different people, but I will say this: I cannot confirm anything I'm about to give you. Everything up until now, I've confirmed myself, but I've never seen an Ermac ever. Now, what what I've been told is when you fight reptile in the pit, I've been told sometimes you get an Ermac. Now, for those of you who don't know what just think Ermac's the character. Ermac actually was was short for something from the game's code programming. Uh, it meant error macro. Now macros are like the, the graphics of the game. And what, what I heard is that you'd fight Reptile in the pit and if an Ermac occurred for some reason, whatever occurred, whatever caused the error, uh, other than uh, Reptile being green, the, the colors changing from Scorpion or sub zeros blue to green, as Ed said, he just changed the colors. Um, it would go orange, and you, and the name on the, the bar, which always says Scorpion when you fight Reptile, by the way. A lot of people are confused by that. But uh, the reason is Ed just didn't change the sprite, because that name isn't text. It's actually a sprite that says Scorpion. He didn't add one that said Reptile. He just put Scorpion's name up there, you know. But, um, you know, obviously when you lose, it says Reptile wins, or when you win, it says you've defeated Reptile, so it's Reptile. But, um, yeah, that name would change to Ermac, I heard. And um, he'd be orange, and then the counter in the in the arcade menu would report an ermac like this. Ermac was an error, and Shotex was that what it's called? I think I just named that after a cousin of mine. As you can see, that's it. Uh, the other rumor came after the game had already come out on home consoles, and that was Nimbus Terraforx. Now, I remember my friend showing me this article. It was in, I always thought it was GamePro, but it turns out I just went on Google and looked, at, looked around a bit. It was EGM that did it, and it was an April Fool's Day joke. So either if you've got an EGM from 1992 or 1993, you'll have it in there somewhere. It's a column on the side. I remember my friend showed me the magazine, and um, it talked about Nimbus Terrafox, this kickboxer hidden in Mortal Kombat 1. I tried to find the information that I've remembered from that article, but I couldn't find it. I remember reading in the article that when you you, you could only do it on the Mega Drive version, and you had to set the flags on and one of the flags always generates a reptile clue. You set that flag on, and when reptile dropped down, you put in this ridiculous code. I remember it was ridiculously long. It was like up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, down, up, left, right. I memorized that code trying to unlock this bastard, and um, it never worked, obviously. But what the, what the article reported was that the dragon in the middle of the select screen turned around, and you got this new character, Nimbus Terrafox, and there were these two screenshots there. Uh, there might have even been another one at the select screen, but I I managed to find this one picture which I've got on the screen now, which had him doing test your might, which was just a guy photoshopped into the picture, and this one this other one where he's doing this flip and kicking the head off on the pit stage, and that was the one that always stuck in here, you know, and um, yeah, I tried to do it, it, never worked, you know, and there yeah, it turned out it was a hoax, and I'm, the thing is um. Uh, 
I don't know where they reported it was a hoax, but I only saw this magazine that one time. My friend had it, and so I never knew it was a hoax, you know. I, I just remember trying it, and it would never work. So I'm just like, it's bull I just remember thinking, it's crap, I can't get it to work, you know. But then again, I thought the Sonic 3 level select code was crap that worked after a while. So <laughs> that up, up, down, down, up, down, up, 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 you know, at the, at the Sega screen. It doesn't work. It's so hard to do that code. Anyway, for those of you who know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, so Nimbus Terror Fox was a joke. Um, I've got a bit of text here I'll put on the screen that I found from PSU Reptile on the Midway boards. I don't know if you typed this up from the article. But uh, yeah, a bit, of, a bit of text there about uh, Nimbus. Um, yeah, kickbox from Earth Realm. Terra Forks meaning Earth and Forks meaning false. So Earth fake or Earth false. You know, um, that's what his character meant. Um, that, that was it pretty much for the rumoured characters in MK1. You had Reptile, Ermac, and Nimbus Terra Forks on the home systems only. So um, The other thing I should talk about is they had a comic book offer with Mortal Kombat 1 uh, to get a comic book. Um, yeah. Now, I consider myself pretty lucky when it comes to Mortal Kombat. I'm always searching, you know, I tell everyone I'm a Mortal Kombat fan, so I've got a big network straight away. Always mention it to new people, so they know I'm hardcore, right? So if they ever find something, they let me know, you know? And I'm here in Melbourne one day, and I drop into this comic, sh comic book store on Burke Street, and I'm like, you know, Mortal Kombat in Australia, like, no one cares, really. <laughs> Except for me and Chris, you know. <laughs> and I go into this comic book store, and I'm like, you got any Mortal Kombat comics? And he's like, in the back, you know, and he, like, points down there, you know. I'm like, oh, okay, you know. And so I go down the back, you know, search under miscellaneous comics under M, you know. Like, uh, all the mainstream comics have a place, but Mortal Kombat would always be, like, in the miscellaneous bin, you know, that no one cared about. I'm the guy who always buys them, you know. Um, so I go in there and I'm looking under there and I'm like, I freak out. I find three Mortal Kombat 1 comic books. I couldn't believe it. I'd already bought one off eBay and there was three just sitting in this box in Melbourne, Australia. I know, you guys are like, what the fuck, right? One, two, three. <laughs> it says Midway at the top here. That was six dollars each. So obviously they they've been bought in America and they found that so somehow found their way to Australia, you know. As you can see, I'll show you guys um, in the comic. Uh, it reports three dollars up here, just like it said on the arcade, and uh, yeah, artwork by John Tobias there, and um, yeah, uh, I was lucky enough to get those. And please, 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 don't send me messages saying can I have one? These aren't for sale. They're for me to keep, um, you know. I, I, the, re the very special stuff I hang on to, you know, because it's, there's not a lot of it around. So please don't send me messages saying, "Will you sell me one?" I won't. I'm telling you now, I won't. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I'm not trying to be a joke, but you know, come on, they're, they're hard to find, all right. And, you know, maybe if Ed Boone said, "Can I have one?" I might consider giving him one. But you know, <laughs> other than that, you know. <laughs> um, the last thing I should talk about is uh, Ed Boon posted a bit of source code from the game uh, on his Twitter once. Uh, the full source code's never been released for Mortal Kombat. That's because they keep whoring it out and reselling it, which is fine, I don't care. <laughs> you know, but it was cool to see a bit of uh, the source code uh, from Mortal Kombat. I think I said, an, uh, I'm pretty sure I sent a message to Ed saying, any chance that I could see that part of the source code that talks about Reptile because of my fascination with the shadows and Reptile and that. I think he did reply back to that saying, yeah, I might uh, send a picture of the conditions for Reptile or something, but he never did. Um, but yeah, the piece of source code that he posted was uh, talking about Sonya's, uh, the sound calls for Sonya and uh, how the code works. It'll like call a sound, then play animation, then play another sound and another animation, you know. Yeah, I just thought I'd include it because it's still part of Mortal Kombat and I might appeal more to the nerdier people. But, um, yeah, you know, I'm trying to be fully comprehensive, so <laughs> check out the source code.
All right, that's pretty much it for the MK1 retrospective. It's been a wild ride. I want to thank all you guys for watching and sticking with uh, with the videos. I know they're long, but you know, I like to make uh, stuff that's informative and entertaining. So uh, I'm glad you guys have liked it. I've gotten a really positive response from this, and a lot of people asking when am I doing MK2 and MK3. I will do them, but please don't expect it next week because I've got to sort of figure out what I'm going to do with MK2, and I've got to think about it. Day by day, you know, I think about what, how I'm sort of going to do it, and then sort of plan it more on the computer, and then do my notes, and then film me, and I've got to sort of think about MK2, because I don't have a lot of stuff for MK2, believe it or not, and um, I wouldn't mind a bit more content, so, uh, yeah. Uh, one last thing I'll close with is, uh, you guys probably saw it until the poster fell, but... Yeah, there's a poster I got for Mortal Monday when uh, Mortal Kombat was coming out on the home systems. That was given to me by uh, a friend uh, called Matthew. Uh, yeah, as you can see, Mortal Monday, September 13th, 1993. I'm not sure where he got that poster from, but yeah, awesome. So yeah, I got a poster of Mortal Monday. And the other thing I've got is someone gave me this once, and I couldn't believe they had this. This just freaked me out. Uh, he came in and he showed me, he had a Mortal Kombat SNES that he got from Japan and it, ha it came with like a little Mortal Kombat 1 poster and I got a photo of it somewhere but I don't know where so um, that's not the, the thing, he was telling me about it, how he got it from Japan and it was absolutely mint. He said if you ever buy games from people from Japan, they keep everything mint, box, you know, it's Japanese way, they don't, they don't trash anything, you know what I mean? And there's actually a game store in Japan called Super Potato, and one day I want to go there, see what MK stuff they got. Uh, I think it'll be great. Uh, but yeah, he said he had at home an electronics boutique catalog that had the Mortal Kombat ad in there and the pre-order for it. And I'm like, no way. He goes, I'll tell you what, you can have it. I actually let me have it, and he bought me the magazine. Look, I shit you not, look how mint this is. I don't even keep my current ones this good condition. But uh, I'll show you guys. So, Sky High Software Savings, Electronics Boutique, uh, August Catalog. That's basically it. If I open it, you'll see there's a lot of uh, PC in here. You know, old PC games. <laughs> After Dark, I remember that one. Uh, Flying toasters and shit. Uh, yeah. Publisher. <laughs> Lol. Old school. Uh, get to the games already. Syndicate. That's an old one. Yeah. So yeah, then you get to the games. Uh, yeah, here's some Nintendo. Some NES games. Look at that. Now you know it's really old. Look, punch out, man. $29.95. Can you believe this? Game Boy games. You know, uh, yeah. There's a Game Gear with Sonic 2. <laughs> you know, this, this, this is such an awesome catalog. The Snares games, you know. It's Vegas Stakes, I've got that one. Mega Drive games. You know, wow. And then you got it right here. Mortal Kombat for Genesis. Pre-purchase Mortal Kombat and get this cool free t-shirt. There it is. For $63.99. The characters in Mortal Kombat are digitized from the actual martial arts footage and offer images that are among the most realistic in video gaming to date. Whoops. The title also featuring nine out of nine of the largest interactive characters each. 92 pixels tall. Oh, wow! 92 pixels tall! That's awesome! <laughs> Ever featured in a video game. Combined with the game's intense, hard-hitting 16 meg graphics, <laughs> Acclaim believes Mortal Kombat will be among the most popular video games to enter the market this year. And were they right? Wow! Um, let me just see if there's anything for Super Nintendo here. I don't think Mortal Kombat got advertised for Super Nintendo in this catalogue for some reason. Hmm. I didn't... Oh, Bubsy, I remember that. 
on this, was that the one? Yeah, on the back it's got another ad. So you can see it here. Pre-purchase Mortal Kombat and get this really cool t-shirt free. Yeah, coming September 13th. So yeah, that was it. There was nothing for Super Nintendo in there. They probably didn't want to advertise the fact that it was crap and it was censored and I hate that version. Uh, for a start, you know, game trailers did a whole thing about the reptile secret, which I'll just put on the end here in case you guys didn't see it. But, um... <laughs> Back when fighting games were just toddlers in the arcades, the over-the-top Mortal Kombat set itself apart with its violence, clip art graphics, and ridiculous fatalities. But the 2D fighter would also spawn one of the most widespread urban legends in gaming. As the myth goes, if you're on the pit stage and see shadows flying over the moon, you have to score two perfect rounds without blocking and perform a fatality. This will then trigger a fight with a ninja called Reptile. Lawless victory fatality. Players in arcades across the U.S. claim to see a mysterious green ninja appear randomly before fights, delivering a cryptic message. This character bore a striking resemblance to Sub-Zero in Scorpion, leading players to believe this was a hidden third ninja. When all of his hidden clues were deciphered, the signs pointed to a showdown with the hidden fighter on the pit stage if certain conditions were met. Reptile is a mainstay in subsequent MK titles as a playable character, but did he really make his debut back in the original? There are more than a handful of versions of Mortal Kombat out there, with at least five different revisions of the arcade version and the various home console ports. A bit of research revealed that Reptile is supposedly only present in certain versions of the arcade game, though he's present in all the home console editions. And to top it off, certain versions prohibited the use of blocking even when performing a fatality. With these tidbits in mind, we entered Shang Tsung's Tournament of Death, seeking more than fame and fortune. On both the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo editions, we were able to score a bout with Reptile on the first try with two perfect rounds. No blocking and a fatality finish, even without shadows flying over the moon. But the arcade versions proved to be more daunting. After spending countless hours fighting our way to the pit stage over and over, we managed to see the flying shadows only a handful of times. Scoring two successive flawless victories proved to be quite a challenge. But finally, after numerous failures, a flash of lightning and crack of thunder signaled the coming of the much-anticipated warrior. Combining the moves of both Scorpion and Sub-Zero, he's a force to be reckoned with. If you're lucky enough to survive the battle, you're awarded a hefty point bonus for your efforts and sent back to the tournament ladder for your next opponent. It takes a great deal of patience and skill, not to mention quarters, but reaching Reptile in Mortal Kombat is more than smoke and mirrors. Yeah, they did that, and uh... They talked about all the conditions of, of Reptile. The whole thing was perfectly done, but they said in the Mega Drive version you could get a double flawless without pit shadows and unlock Reptile. That is not the case. The Mega Drive version was actually out of the uh, Super Nintendo Mega Drive, the, the most popular consoles. Um, that was the version that was perfecto. Uh, it allowed you to, you know, you had to wait for shadows. Excuse me. You had to wait for shadows, and then you had to get double flawless, no blocking fatality. Um, I don't know why Game Trailers reported that on the Mega Drive version. It was the same as the SNES, the crappy, shitty SNES version, uh, where you just need to get a double flawless, and, and that's it. Double flawless and fatality. And, um, yeah, you got to fight Reptile in the pit. Uh, the pit on the Super Nintendo version looked like shit. It looked like some fucking cleaner went down there and went, Oh my god! It's so dirty down here, I'm gonna clean it! You know, and clean up all the gore, all the heads, all the dead bodies. You got this spotless pit with no blood at all. Even if they fell down, no blood. And yeah, you got to fight Reptile in this really boring arena. So, and it really pissed me off that um, it made, it exposed Reptile. Like, everyone then knew about Reptile. If they hadn't have done that, made it so easy to access Reptile, the secret would still be intact, a lot more stronger. But because of that shit, you know, they ruined it. And it's one of the things that ruined the awesome secret. Uh, yeah, that's it, okay.
<laughs> now that really is it. That's everything. I just remembered I forgot about the game travel thing, but yeah, I thought I should mention that to you guys. Um, yeah, so you can uh, check that out. But yeah, thank, thanks again for watching. Uh, it's been real fun making this retrospective and letting my knowledge pass on to you guys. Now you guys know everything I know about Mortal Kombat. Thanks again. One last thing I just wanted to one to add on here too is the uh, I had a user uh, here's his username I've forgotten it it's something wrong uh, he sent me two videos during between these two retrospectives uh, basically G4 TV did an icons segment on Mortal Kombat and I had Ed Boon and Vogel and and uh, Tony Goski all talking about MK1 where the character inspiration came from and that. Uh, the videos do go for 20 minutes uh, if you watch both parts, so I don't think I'll include the full things in here. I'm just going to give you a little little snippet, but I'm going to put the links in the video. Uh, if you click them, or in the description, probably better. I uh, don't want you guys leaving my retrospective. <laughs> so, no, no, I'll put it in both. It'll be in the description and on the screen. I'll add a note um, so you can guys watch, can watch both. Um, yeah, and uh, watch watch both because they're great. Uh, it talks about the arcade and then sort of moves into the home part of it. I actually had seen part two, but I'd never watched part one, so and I just totally forgot about it when I was doing this retrospective. So I'm glad that he sent me the videos and reminded me because anything about the the, the crew of MK talking about MK1, I'd really like to have in in the retrospective. The only thing I don't really have is any footage of Dan Ford and talking about making the music or sounds. On the game, I'd love to have that. I've never seen it anywhere. Um, you'll hear Steve say Dan came in at the last minute and did the music, but I'd love to hear him talk about making the music on the first game. I think that'd be cool. But yeah, um, check out my little uh, preview of of the content from the G4 videos. Thanks again to this guy. <laughs> Soon, the two decide to work together on a new game. So we had this conversation when neither of us had really worked on a game with each other and said, you know, yeah, we should do a fighting game sometime. At the time, Midway had uh, a hardware system that could support digitized graphics, which was fairly new back in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. And we wanted to really take advantage of that. And we thought that a fighting game or something where characters could be represented very large on screen would be something that we could take advantage of and, and create a game around. They meet with an early setback. We wanted to make, you know, Van Damme, the video game. At the time, I think he might have uh, signed a deal with Sega or something. You know, they said, you know, sorry, sorry you guys, but you can't uh, have it. And, you know, Bloodsport, I think it just come out. And we were all bummed out. But the release of a popular fighting game helps get their project off the ground. Street Fighter 2 had come out and proved successful in the arcades, and so that just kind of bolstered our desire to, to do a fighting game. And it also gave management uh, the opportunity to give us a go-ahead to start work on the project. So we went into the back, you know, with the blue screen and videotaped some friends, you know, throwing kicks and punches, and, and I mocked something up in my office, and suddenly when we got this uppercut going, management came in and they saw it and they were like, you know, okay, you know, green light. When we started work on Mortal Kombat, uh, because we were digitizing actors, we needed to find real martial artists to work with. And it just so happened that um, some friends of mine had been practicing martial arts for years and years, and they were very good at it. They were the sort of the go-to guys for us on the first game. So at that point, it was like, you know, a three-person team, and my job was going to be basically doing backgrounds. John Tobias would be doing the character work. John would design the characters and what they look like, their costumes. And Ed would be doing the programming. And I was kind of like, how did the game play? How quickly were the, the controls responsive? And what were the secret moves? Uh, and then later on, you know, as the game was getting nearer to completion, Dan Forden came into the picture and started doing sounds for the game. <laughs> So really a four-person team, Mortal Kombat was just four people, really. I just started. Mortal Kombat is underway, but with established giants like Street Fighter II, will the team at Midway be able to make a game that can compete? It's 1991, and a team of developers led by Ed Boon and John Tobias is hard at work making sure Mortal Kombat isn't just another fighting game. What separated us visually 
from Street Fighter. We had blood. It was almost like, you know, an MTV version of uh, Street Fighter, you know, very American. Street Fighter was really like a uh, like hand-drawn kind of cartoon in uh, Mortal Kombat. It's like digitized graphics, but kind of hand-painted on top of it to digitize, so it was a polished, digitized look. It had a unique look to it. One of the first things Midway does is create a story with a distinct cast of characters. Mortal Kombat really started out as like this whole tournament thing. It's kind of like very similar to Enter the Dragon. The whole storyline is just seemed a little bit bigger than a normal video game. And just something you could uh, relate more, get more into it than a normal fighter. In Mortal Kombat, they, they really spent a lot of time developing kind of mythology about each of these characters and their backstory. The characters in the game are really well defined. Just the way they acted and sort of the way they looked, each character really had its own kind of sensibility to it. Each character has a real repertoire of moves that makes sense for that character. I think you easily found a favorite character when you played that game. The Jean-Claude Van Damme idea didn't pan out, so we already had this character that was kind of dressed up like he was in Bloodsport, and that's kind of like a whole Johnny Cage thing. There was a character in uh, Big Trouble in Little China, this guy with a big hat and electricity and stuff, and we were like, you know, we got to make a character like that, and that's where Raiden was born. Liu Kang is kind of a hybrid of Bruce Lee and a couple other martial arts stars that we've seen. And then Kano was this guy with this metal eye patch, and I think Terminator 2 or something had come out recently, and they said, okay, let's make a guy whose skin is peeling away. We ran out of memory. We had to have two characters with only one amount of memory in the game, so we said, let's make a yellow ninja, tint and blue, and we make another character out of it. We came up with Sub-Zero and Scorpion. Then our CEO said, no, you gotta add one more character, the female character in the game. Sonya wins. I said, oh, let's call her Sonya. And we threw her in the game, and all of a sudden, we had our cast of seven. But what truly sets Mortal Kombat apart from other fighters is also what will make it infamous. Street Fighter had this feature where a guy would be dizzy. And you would get a free hit when your opponent is dizzy. And I hated being the guy who was dizzy, but I loved being the guy who would make somebody dizzy. So we moved that part of the game to the end of the round. And we said, okay, now just give him a big uppercut at the end. And somebody said, wouldn't it be great if you could, like, you know, just tear their heart out? So fatalities were introduced in the first Mortal Kombat. Sub-Zero could rip the spine out of a character. Sonya could have a kiss of death. People always remember the fatalities in Mortal Kombat. It was the over-the-top finishing move. It's like the, the grand finale. Hey, win. We do the whole dun-dun-dun, fade to black. If you know your right 20-button combination at the right time, then you can do this amazing effect. And then the whole thing is like, wow, how'd you do that? And that built the mystery, and the mystery got the fans' attention and kind of snowballed from there. It's a lot more fun to beat your opponent by throwing them with the spikes, as opposed to just saying, game over, I win. In 1992, Mortal Kombat rolls out to arcade, and the reaction is explosive. The, the reaction to the players was ridiculous. I mean, you see crowds of, you know, 50 people crowded around the game. People were driving from New York to play this new fighting game. People play it from 4 in the afternoon till midnight. People would be running around the game, like, screaming, like, cracking up and stuff. So people got a big kick out of it. How can you not rip the spine out of somebody that you're playing against and not think this is the greatest game ever? In ball of Alrighty, I got one more thing to say. I know, I keep saying this is the last thing, this is the last thing. I mean, it's almost midnight here. I've been editing this video all day, so... Um, I just went through my, my pictures and uh, I've got a, a picture here that you guys are going to like. Uh, I'm putting it up on the video now. And basically what you can see here is it's a shop front of some women's health clinic or something. Health salon, or no, exercise place, whatever. But what it used to be was an arcade, and that was the first time I laid eyes on Mortal Kombat was in that shop. 
that's what you're seeing now. I just thought I'd put that up for a little kicker. One other thing I'd like to put, uh, include in this video too, is uh, the Mortal Kombat Netherrealm guys released a video a few days ago about the, uh, the history of the pit. And because it's so relevant uh, for the new game, I thought I'd chuck that on the end here. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So enjoy that one, and after that we're going to roll the MK1 credits because those people deserve to be credited for making such an awesome game. Thanks again for watching. The Pit. Finish him! Those unfortunate enough to provoke Shang Tsung's ire find themselves forced to compete at the pit. A bridge suspended high above a sea of razor-sharp demon steel blades. It is the most treacherous of all fighting arenas on the island. Though its original construction was without blades, Shang Tsung grew agitated by the number of survivors and commanded they be added to better ensure fatalities. He then positioned a camouflaged reptile at the bottom of the pit to finish any who survived the fall. The carnage below is eventually consumed by the many subterranean creatures that dwell beneath the grounds of the palace. An unceremonious end for the unworthy.